呃，大家好，我是主持人 PM 五，很抱歉我们在处理一下投影片跟远端连线的事情，所以可能要耽搁一下子。呃，我们有其中一位讲者，他今天不能来，是呃加拿大的 Derek， 他因为一些行程的问题，那今天只能够远远端连线，所以我们等一下会先呃透过 Skype Skype 跟他连线。那先跟大家说一下今天的呃座谈的形式。今天的座谈的形式，我们今天的四位讲者会先各给呃一位十五分钟，每一位会各给十五分钟的时间介绍一下他在这个领域的工作跟他对这个题目的想法。那接下来就会进入 Q&A 的时间，所以呃我们前面四个讲者的顺序，先是 Derek 用远端连线跟我们讲他的工作，再来是唐凤。再来是法国的 c l e m o n 最后是 Perry。那啊、呃，后面的 Q&A 的时间 ，OK， 后面的 Q&A 的时间，除了请大家在现场可以用你们面前的麦克风自由发问以外，我们也有开一个 Slido 的 event。那个 Slido 的啊、呃，如果你们有用 Slido 的话 ，Slido 的 event name 是一零零一 Nation One Zero Zero One Nation。那你们可以在演讲中就呃用 Slido 对这四位讲者提问，我们之后会呃统一的 Q&A 时间。哦，对不起，是一零零六，今天的日期一零零六 Nation。啊，再重复一遍 ，Slido Event 的名字是一零零六 Nation。那你们可以在这段时间啊、呃、演讲的时间就对这四位讲者提问，我们之后会统一的收集问题然后回答。All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister and uh, CV Hacker. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to share with you for the next 15 minutes about smart policies and social innovation. Uh, and this is an all-English session, and I promised uh, that people over in R0, which is moderated by Peggy, uh, 社群參政有興趣,想要聽到比較多爆料以及是中文的議程軌的話,現在到R0還來得及。OK,好,好,那以上是工商時間結束,我們繼續回到英文. In any case, yes, um, so uh, as Taiwan's Digital Minister uh, in charge of social innovation, uh, our main idea is to promote the idea of innovating with people and instead of for the people. We are promoting the idea of power with instead of power over. And so this is my office, like literally. Literally, my office. Um, when I joined the cabinet, there's three compacts, not contracts, that I agreed with the cabinet. The first is location independence. Whenever, wherever I'm working, I'm all working in the office, so I get to have this kind of office, which is co-designed by hundreds of social innovators, and this is painted by people with Down syndromes. Turns out, they're excellent artists, see the world with a different lens. And the second is voluntary association. I don't give orders. I don't take orders. Every ministry work with me by voluntary association. And because of that, I don't talk to, for example, the Minister of Defense saying, tomorrow you're going to be radically transparent. Uh, but instead, if they have anything that they would like to engage more people, they can come to this space. And not just for public service, but actually for everybody. Every Wednesday from 10 AM to 10 PM, if you have anything you would like to discuss with me, you can just come here, provided you agree to publish the transcript online. And Finally, the, the third is radical transparency. We make sure that all the dealings, not just with journalists and lobbyists, but also internal meetings, publish everything online so that whenever experiments happen, they don't have to succeed. If they fail, there is actually no failure because the context of this experiment, the data, the source, everything of this experiment is up there for everybody to use. So when you visit the Social Innovation Lab, sometimes you will see those uh, new alien life forms, uh, which are <laughs> uh, self-driving vehicles, uh, but they're tricycles. And so they have the same right of road as passengers. Uh, if they run into buildings, it's no big deal. And it's all open source from the MIT Media Lab anyway. So some people would like to change this uh, into a face of a cat or something uh, to express the emotion of these uh, vehicles, or they want to solve a real social problem like people going to Jianguo flower market, and these things can help you carry the pots of orchids, and at the end of it, you can hop on it and, and go back to your home, and then they go elsewhere. So basically
basically it's personal, like personal computing. It's open, so people can change the innovation. And the most important thing is that it's transparent. It is happening in a place where hundreds of social innovators can witness how these AIs interact with people day by day. And so why are we using this kind of collaborative governance? Because we want to change the governance model. In the previous century, the idea very simply is the government is like the rope in the middle, and people care about the environment, maybe talk with the environmental agency, that's one knot. People care about economy, maybe talk with the Ministry of Economy, which is another knot. And the people, you know, in the middle, the career public service is invisible from the outside, but there's lots of tension that is uh, in between. And that was because the government see itself as the role of a organizer and of arbiter of the civil society and private sector. But now, with collaborative governance, we're asking a different set of questions. We're asking, given our very different positions, are there some common values? And given our common values, can there be innovations that makes things work for everyone? And so if we keep asking those two questions in a facilitative manner, new ideas can emerge like those self-driving tricycles that can be good both economically, socially, and also environmentally. And everybody gets to have the input into the creation and maintenance and co-ownership of this kind of creation. Uh, so this is what we mean by social innovation. Innovation that solves the social and environmental problem and with everybody's input. Now, of course, a uh, key question on everybody's mind is that, so how many laws will this break? Uh, and how many regulations uh, will this need to be challenged? And will not the career bureaucracy block uh, the innovators from innovating? Um, and the answer is, Hundreds of laws, hundreds of regulations are going to be challenged and broken. And this is why we uh, devised this idea of sandbox. A sandbox.org.tw is a one-stop shop where you can go to, and then basically there's already hundreds of cases that say, you know, for example, I want to offer my private parking space. A is a part-time. When I go to work for eight hours, I want other people to be able to use it for parking and charging them for it. But uh, I mean, I'm not the parking lot, so maybe I don't want to be charged with the text of the parking lot. And people can challenge the existing regulations simply by posting their case online for the common good, transparently for everybody to see. And the people there will help you pro bono to find the right uh, municipality and the right uh, people to handle this kind of situations. So at the moment, there's four sandboxes uh, in Taiwan, and there's more to come. Each sandbox allows for a limited period and a limited space to break the law or regulation for the experiment's uh, result to be shared with everybody. Uh, for the thing like shared parking sp space, that's the NDC platform economy passed uh, this January, a uh, result of the VTOWN process. Actually, all of these are a result of the VTOWN process. Uh, the second one passed this April is FinTech Sandbox, where, uh, for example, when you open a bank account, uh, you can, for example, provide two ID cards to an over-the-counter. But now, one FinTech Sandbox is already planning to run starting later this year, where you can use your mobile identity with your telecom, and that will also uh, determine the kind of loan you can get based on the telecom bills, whether you paid it or not, and things like that. And so this is really breaking existing regulations, but we allow them for a year to experiment. And finally, at the end of the year, we expect to pass the UV law, which allows uh, not tricycles, but also cars that fly or ships that go to the road or whatever. Uh, <laughs> as long as it solves a real social <laughs> need, the local municipality can offer up a space for the people to devise and play with these new AI creatures uh, for a year. And during that year, not only the data need to be shared to a multi-stakeholder panel chaired by the Ministry of e uh, Economy Affairs, but also you can extend the scope of experiment if it goes well. If it doesn't go well, well, we thank the investors for everybody learns something, right? But if it goes well and if the regulation change after 60 days of public commentary, then the regulation just change the, to your version, your forked version will get merged back. And if the members of the parliament need to deliberate up for four years, then you essentially get a monopoly for that experimentation period. After the new laws get signed into the effect, then the innovation becomes true. So if you go to Sandbox or GTW, there's already hundreds of cases. Now, of course, with the official um, endorsement and office hour, a lot of people uh, will ask, 
what about other people living in other counties? We understand that people in Taipei can just come to my office every Wednesday and have hackathons and whatever. But if you don't uh, live in a place near to the high-speed rail station, isn't you essentially excluded from this open policy-making process? And the answer is that every couple Tuesday, uh, I just go to, for example, that is Hualien, and this is Taidong. And whenever I go to there and work with social innovator there, I maybe stay for a night, I maybe stay for an entire day. Our discussion is being live-casted to the social innovation lab to the 12 different ministries people here and they have to answer in real time and had it been you know one-to-one -one conversation with one ministry there's a tendency for one ministry to push to another ministry but now it because all 12 ministries are here they would just talk among themselves and figure something out so for example the cooperative movement is now being reclassified to be qualified to enter a lot of uh, local revitalization projects associations nonprofits can now own subsidiary companies there's many regulatory innovations that are born just by the people in their natural habitat explain their cases for the people in the 12 ministry to see and to reach a horizontal understanding and a virtual team and of course we will make sure that all the new innovations are on display for everybody to see so for example if a self-driving car or truck or whatever uh, is going to be enrolled into a sandbox even before the multi-stakeholder panel we'll make sure that it's on display on Shaolin uh, city which is very close to a high-speed rail station so you can just go to the zoo well a zoo, virtual zoo, uh, to see those new creatures. And we have uh, lots of simulation scenarios, uh, like during, uh, I don't know how to translate Rao Jing, uh, the circulation of the goddess, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, lots of motorcycles, lots of uh, different uh, traffic uh, situations. You can first see the simulation here in the control center before integrating it in our everyday life. And the most important thing here is that we see AI as something that could be amended by the collective intelligence instead of something that overwhelms or uh, oppresses collective intelligence. AI must always work in conjunction and in service of the collective intelligence. And so that brings to our AI power conversation. The, all the fintech and um, platform economy and the UV sandbox has gone through this process. Uh, in the VTOWN process, we use AI to moderate human discussions, to ask people how they feel about a certain thing. And so we crowdsource, of course, the facts, and then we ask people's feelings. And in this conversation, there's no right or wrong about feelings. It's just whether it resonates with people or not. And based on the feelings, the stakeholders can then propose ideas. And the best ideas are the ones that take care of the most people's feelings. So for example, uh, Lisa or Zhu, uh, during uh, the uh, UV consultation, posted that she thinks field tests of a autonomous driving on public roads should have a predictable space and time boundary. Now you can agree or disagree. If you click agree or disagree, your avatar will move among your Facebook or Twitter friends to show how much uh, resonance your ideas have and if answering for a few questions you can also propose new questions for the AI to do the clustering and a principal component analysis and so always after three weeks or so we find people agree to disagree on a few divisive statements but it always collides on the consensus statements and we use those consensus statement to make judgments about uh, for example whether to continue the sandbox um, conversation or to whether to make the regulation and to define the boundary of those new sandbox laws and the interesting thing is if you use the social media it's usually the other way around right so what makes it different from the social media is that there is no reply button if you have the reply button you will maybe attack this sentiment or this statement but because there's no reply button just like on Slido uh, the only recourse is to propose something more nuanced more eclectic for other people to uh, vote on so in this way we make sure that people's feelings are what binds the business interest, the social interest, the environment interest in a collaborative governance way, without which it is just individual people talking to individual agencies. But through this cross-agency mechanism, we make sure that people's feelings are really reflected into the process. So when we went through Taiwan, we discovered some many common interests uh, and people already using civic tech uh, to solve their local social issues. So I'm sure a lot of people here in Taiwan know about the Airbox, which partners with the GovZero uh, air pollution visualization network. Now, in many uh, UN-related uh, meetings that I uh, gave telepresence or in-person uh, presentations, when I showed those two thousands of points that people just set up on their balcony, on their home, on their schools, and so on, the number one question I get from other people from Asian countries is that, doesn't this undermine the legitimacy of your 
National Environmental Protection Agency, isn't this a threat to the national administration in our country? N um, not uh, like 2,000 people. If it's 200 people, all these people will either get disappeared or we'll just push them into the government. But in any case, we will not let this kind of movement grow to thousands of people strong. And my answer is always like in Taiwan, we see the freedom of expression, of assembly, of speech as core value. They are not instrumental values. The the most important value is the vibrant civil society. And so if we cannot be the civil society, we just join the civil society. And so this is the civil IoT project's stance, which is a sponsor, I think, to this very summit. We basically say, in any cases where you can set up we're not going to compete. We're going to offer, for example, more inexpensive measurement devices. But in places where you cannot enter as a citizen scientist, for example, here, this is very important because that tells whether the air pollution comes from the uh, you know, outside of Taiwan or whether inside Taiwan. If we don't have that number, it's very difficult to tell whether it's of a foreign nature or not. And there's no way that airbox people will go to the middle of the Taiwan Strait and <laughs> put their sensors there. And But we are going to. So in our offshore wind turbines, we're going to set up IoT system to make sure that they report uh, back to the same system that the civil IoT system is using. So this is really multi-sectoral. And the open data not just come from the government side, but also from the citizen side as well. And I hear that people like JSERV is working on distributed ledgers to make sure that their numbers are snapshotted and stored on a uh, IOTA distributed ledger to make sure that we don't change the number the day before the election. So uh, it <laughs> helps to put everybody um, to account. And the great thing about this kind of technology is that it spreads naturally because it's open innovation. We don't have to sign a bilateral agreement with a country or whatever. It's all on GitHub, so people just <laughs> learn about it and deploy it uh, everywhere in the world. And so in this way, we at attract the best people to use this common evidence in a way that can establish the common conversation among people of human activity and environmental uh, meteorological data. A lot of mayoral candidates ask me if we can post the winners of this online before the election. Uh, we cannot, uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I think science it's more important than the election, so we will do the science right, <laughs> uh, and you'll see the fruits of this visualization uh, later, later next year. And so in conclusion, <laughs> I would like to say that I see main work is working on the partnership for the goals, not just for economy or environment or society in different uh, silos, in different portions of one day's time and things like that, but to make sure that innovation are good simultaneously for all the global goals through this uh, common data and evidence-based uh, discussion. And so finally, because I talk about AI and distributed ledgers and virtual reality, whatever other technologies, there is a poem that is my job description that I wrote two years became the digital minister I like to share with you, and it goes like this. When we see the internet of the things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And finally, Whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you so much. Uh, please welcome our next speaker, Derek. Oh boy. Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, the connection holds. Um, it's it's kind of crazy to think that like, right now I'm calling you guys from the other side of the world. Uh, so, good afternoon. Uh, it is currently 3.50 here in Canada in the morning. Um, so, I'm very excited to be joining you guys here today. Um, so, I think my introduction was done a bit earlier, but just again, uh, my name is Derek Alton. I'm part of the strategic partnerships team uh, for the digital collaboration division uh, for the government of Canada. Um, and yeah, let's start this presentation here. So I share screen. So you guys able to see my screen okay? Yes, yes. Perfect. All right, good, excellent. Uh, so this presentation is about imagining a digital nation. And so this is 
a topic that has become a very uh, hot topic here in Canada uh, over the last couple of years. We're really trying to bring our government into the 21st century. Um, it's been sort of the focus of the, the mandate of our government for the last three years is how do we make Canada into a digital nation? How do we make the government of Canada a digital government? Um, we have a new CIO who's, who's really focused on, on transforming the way our government works on the inside. Um, and in the last year or two, we've also shifted into more of a, a leadership role on the international stage. Uh, we are hugely honored to become co-chairs of the Open Government Partnership for this year. And hopefully I'll see some of you guys at the summit we're hosting in May for the Open Government Partnership. Uh, as well as we've joined the D7, the Digital 7, which are, are seven countries, uh, governments uh, around the world that are putting a big focus on how do we become more digital as governments. Um, but the key thing about digital is it's not just putting government services on a website. That's not necessarily what makes something digital. It's, it's much deeper. It's more cultural change, a cultural transformation. Uh, and so to that end, one of the things that we've been working on as Government of Canada is a set of digital principles. Now we're calling them digital standards um, that will sort of help give some direction and help us as a government become more digital. And, and this is our second iteration. We meet the, in the fall. Uh, version of this was made and sent out to uh, to the world and we got a whole bunch of feedback both internally but also from all sorts of different community organizations and groups to help us figure out what should these digital principles, these digital standards be. And so this is our second iteration uh, that was just launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's it's evergreen. It means it's gonna be it's gonna be continually changing and growing as our context shifts and as we learn more through doing. Uh, and, and trying to live out these, these standards, we'll get a better understanding of how we need to tweak and change. But I don't talk too much about the digital standards per se, but rather on a specific project or initiative that I'm, I'm involved in uh, that we believe is sort of helping, or we hope is helping model what it means to be a digital nation. And so that is the Open Accessible Digital Workspace. There we go. Um, and in a way, I like to think of the Open Accessible Digital Workspace is its example of open government in practice, taking the concepts and the theories of open government and actually trying to apply it in how government works on a day-to-day -day basis. We're really trying to reflect on how government can work together to empower, <laughs> connect, and people to co-create with each other, citizens to create a better world. There we go. Um, but first things first, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And I think the problem we're trying to solve with this is that the context that we live in has shifted. We now live in a digital age. The majority of our interactions and how we engage and experience the world is now mediated and moderated by digital technology. Case in point, this presentation right now. Um, and that's had huge ramifications on how we experience the world and how we interact with the world and, and the role government plays within that. So our society has become more networked as a result. There's way more data floating around uh, that we can work with. Uh, as people, we're much more engaged in shaping our world and personalizing our experience of the world around us to better meet our needs and our, our desires. And this is something that government has been slow to respond to. We've been very, you know, government, societies become more networked and we're still working in their silos. The world is changing faster and faster, and we're still like behind the curve and slow to react and slow to change and keep up with the, the pace of change. Um, and so we really need to be better. We need to be better as government. But there's also lots of opportunity here. I mean, we could do so much together here. I mean, we could work to co-create with citizens and experts across sectors in a way we never could before. We can find, recruit, and nurture talent help connect skills with opportunities to use those skills to change. We can use the crowd to solve issues that matter to our citizens. Nowadays, we realize that, that the answer to our problems might not be within the knowledge base of the actual team that's working on the problem. It might exist on the other side of the world, and we now have the tools to help capture and harness this knowledge of, of society and reflect it in the world. We're trying to create an, an an open and inclusive, diverse digital public space. I mean, public spaces are so key to democracy. What does a public space look like in the digital world that we now live in? And there's an opportunity to, you know, now that we're more interconnected and can share information, to build things once and get a benefit not just with our own team, but, you know, across society, across the globe. You don't need to keep repeating and, and, and co uh, you don't need to keep all trying to solve the same problem independent of each other. 
And then, and the outcome of this is that there's an increased value that we can create with reduced cost. And, and something that really sort of highlighted this problem for me, this opportunity for me, uh, was is my role uh, in strategic partnerships means I get to interact with lots of different organizations and groups, particularly other governments, both within Canada, the many different levels of government, but also uh, around the world uh, in meeting people who work in governments in different countries and realizing that we're all trying to solve the same problems. And that there's a huge opportunity here if we start collectively coming together and solving them together as opposed to trying to solve them in their silos. This is the opportunity that exists. And, and this is sort of the hope that we're, we're trying to sort of capture with the open accessible digital workspace. So, so what is the open accessible digital workspace? I kind of like to think of the open accessible digital workspace as the digital public square. You know, the public square of the digital world. And it's something that's based on open source software, open standards. It's a workspace that is sort of a suite of integrated, accessible tools that connect people to each other and the information they need to work better. It's something that we can, buy, we can fund and contribute uh, to new and existing open source projects. And through that, that investment, we can raise the bar not just for ourselves and our own team, but for everybody the benefit of open source. And it's an ecosystem anyone can add services into it. They can use the data to make better decisions. It becomes a public good, a public service to all society and all the world. By building it together, we can create a diverse and inclusive space for all sorts of voices and different perspectives. And this digital public square can be used and reused and adapted and changed, and it's free of advertising forever. That's the vision of the open, accessible digital workspace. But that's sort of kind of conceptual. So another metaphor I like to use to sort of make sense of what is it we're talking about when we're talking about this, this open accessible digital workspace, this digital public square, is the idea of a, a toolbox, a digital toolbox. So we use tools to help us do things more effectively, more efficiently, uh, and we develop a set of tools that we use regularly to help us build bookshelves, build a house, do all sorts of different things. We also have it's, you know, we interact and live in more of a digital world. We're starting to develop more and more of a, a digital toolbox, a set of tools that we use to work in a digital way. So, for example, right now we're using Skype. This is an example of a digital tool. Uh, you guys are using Slido, I believe, as mentioned earlier. That's another type of digital tool. Email, instant messaging. These are all digital tools that we're starting to use uh, to help us get things done and do things together in a digital world. And so the idea of the open accessible digital workspace is to create a suite of open source digital tools that are free and accessible to everybody and that are integrated so that collectively they develop this, this common platform experience that allow us to connect and to collaborate and to do and be government in real time together across geographic barriers. That's the idea of the open accessible digital workspace. So, that's the broad vision, and we, we pitched this to our, our governments uh, like internally in the spring, and we were given sort of a three-year uh, sort of runway to, and some base funding to see if we could take this from a conceptual stage and into actually something practical that we could actually build, use, uh, and, and sort of share to the world. And so where do we start? How do we build this open, accessible digital workspace collectively together? Um, with a real toolbox, there are certain base elements. First, you need a toolbox that help you kind of organize and access the tools that you want. And then you have some base tools that are sort of the foundational tools. I mean, if you're going to build a house, you're probably going to need a hammer. That's pretty much a standard tool. You're probably going to need a tape measure. There's some base tools. So we're thinking, what are the base important tools needed for uh, a digital nation? And so here's sort of our first crack at what this could look like. Um, first off, the idea of a single, a single sign-in, authentication, a way that you can identify as you as yourself that then connects you to a profile, a profile that you can then move and, and move around to access all the different tools. This connection of a single account sign-on with a profile as a service, for me, I kind of view this as the digital toolbox. This is a container that the tools then sit within to give you access to the tools and be able to move and shape them and, and design your own toolbox within uh, own set of tools within that toolbox. The next one that we're working on is this idea of an open collaborative space, a sort of base foundational collaborative space. 
um, that allows people to connect, form groups around issues and projects they're working on, and share files and have discussions and, and that base level of collaboration. Uh, so we're already doing this. We've, we've, we're using an, the open source platform ELB. Uh, and we're actually working on it with the government of the Netherlands to sort of develop this base foundational platform. Uh, another thing we're working on is uh, we're calling it Kruger Marketplace, but it's a chance to connect. It's the idea of connecting talent with opportunities. There's a ton of different ideas and skill sets. How do we more effectively connect those skill sets uh, with the opportunities that exist? And so we're developing a base platform that does a lot of that. Um, so that's sort of another thing that we're building as a sort of base foundation. Another thing it was one that actually developed quite by accident. Um, as a team, we realized we needed instant messaging to more effectively connect and collaborate together and get our work done. And so we, we after a couple months of testing different options, ended up selecting uh, the open source platform Rocket Chat. Um, it's like an open source version of Slack. Uh, it's an instant messaging platform. And, and just kind of adopted it and started using it as a team to help us work better. And then word got out within the government, and so all of a sudden all these other teams started using it and adopting it. So these are the base sort of foundational tools that we're currently working on um, to try to build that foundation, open accessible workplace. That's where we're at right now, but we recognize that we can't do this on our own. This is, this is something that needs to be, it, the true potential of this lies when we come together and collaborate across different groups. So the strategic, strategic partnership team that I'm part of is really working hard to find ways of connecting the dots between the work that other groups are doing. Uh, so for example, um, when I was in France, uh, France is using Riot. We've got an instant messaging uh, platform that they're working with um, and doing great work on it. So maybe we let France really develop that in and that becomes that the instant messaging platform for the open accessible digital workspace that we can all use anywhere. Um, you know, Taiwan, you guys have got a bunch of different platforms that you're using to do a lot of really cool stuff that makes it easier for citizens to participate actively in co-creating policy and programs. Maybe these are platforms that we can adopt and be part of the open accessible digital workspace. So how do we create space for different organizations and governments to start sharing with each other and collectively building this interweaving network of open source platforms and tools to create this digital public square that allows us to work? That's the big question we're working on this year is strategic partnerships. We've got a series of different pilot projects we're working on. Um, one of the things I'm working on right now is finding ways to bring uh, municipalities together to identify a common pain point and then identify an uh, open source digital solution to that pain point and then have those municipalities collectively together invest in supporting the development of that open source solution, which then gets adopted into the open accessible digital workspace. And if we can show how that model works, that becomes something that can be replicated anywhere and everywhere to allow all sorts of different groups to can start investing in, in these open source platforms. Uh, so over time, we develop this large suite of uh, open source digital tools that help us do our job. And, and they're all interconnected more than for this open and accessible uh, digital workplace. Um, well, I'm, I think I'm going to stop there for now. Oh, one more slide I should show you guys. This is one I get really excited about. So this is, for me, this is how I kind of vision. You know, when we talk about what is this open accessible digital workspace, this slide for me helps visualize it. So you see you've got the enterprise authentication. That's your doorway in. That's your toolbox to get into your set of tools. That then connects you with your profile as a service. That's your profile that helps you then personalize your access to the different tools. And then each of these is a different type of tool. It's, it's a microservice model. So it's a series. Each tool has a specialized use case. So it's more of a toolbox as opposed to a Swiss Army knife. What this allows people to do is it allows them to mix and match. It allows them to choose the digital, the digital platform, the digital tool that they want to use, uh, and then just bring it into this ecosystem of interconnected platforms. This means that groups can go open source, which is what we always encourage, but they can also choose to uh, adopt proprietary software as well. Uh, maybe they're already in a, an arrangement, some type of uh, sole contract that's giving them a platform that they're paying for, and they're already in for like a three-year contract, they can just bring that in. Hopefully, uh, the platform will be interoperable and be able to be part of this larger ecosystem. This allows for more experimentation, allows for more personalization, and it makes it easier for all sorts of different groups to build pieces that they see are missing and then add them to this growing ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to stop there, um, and I really look forward to digging more into this in the Q&A. So thank you so much, guys, for this opportunity to present this idea, and I hope uh, you guys are interested, and uh, please reach out uh, if you want to learn more, and uh, I'd love to wait so we can collaborate more effectively together.
My name is Clément Mabi. I come from France. I'm from the University of Technology de Compiègne. And before to start, I would like to thank the organization team to invite me and to thank the Bureau Français de Taipei, the French office, to make this trip possible. So, to echo to Audrey and Derek, my first question will be, what w should a digital nation be? From a normative perspective, so a theoretical one, a digital nation should be seen as a nation where people have found solutions to mobilize digital culture in order to organize the way of living together and renew the relationship between citizens and institutions by more co-construction of public policies and more transparencies of public institutions. This call for digital technologies should allow a continuous democracy and therefore a more permanent public deliberation to promote the abilities of technologies to reform public services and enhancing citizen trust in the government. From a grounded perspective, my argument will be to say that the digital nation needs two main ingredients to succeed. A state, an administration that has completed its digital transition and a mobilized and organized digital civil society ci through civic tech. For my demonstration, I will use the French case. So, is France a digital nation? France is famous for many things. Yeah, of course, sorry. France is famous for many things. Wine, strikes, our cute accent in English, but also revolutions. What about our digital revolution? Has France started its digital revolutions? Can we see a 2.0 nation, or at least 1.0 nation? Well, I think we are on the beta version. We can see the development of a digital democracy with more citizen initiatives like petition, mobilization platforms, public consultation softwares, or collaborative tool works. However, many barriers remain before this promised land before a digital nation. Let's keep it modest. So, it's true that there is some positive trends. We have since 2011 an open data policy, which is by default in every administration since 2016. We are officially involved in the OpenGov partnership since 2014. There was an OGP summit in Paris in 2016. We have the development of major public consultation, like for legislative draft, with around 20,000 participants for the most successful in 2016. We have a proactive policy of inclusion since 2017. The institutions organized an innovative coalition of actors in France called the MedNum, which is bringing together on an equal footing all the actors involved in the issues of digital inclusion, including public authorities. There is also a reform of the National Assembly to adopt some digital principles, like a new petition right or a possibility to, to citizen agenda setting in 2018. There is a, a new program called Public Interest Entrepreneurs Program, which try to introduce agile methods from startup to the administration, a bit like PO Network, I guess, here. And there is also a national impulsion for the development of a tech for good ecosystem in France due to, to the President Macron. But there is also in France, we still have a very strong representative and leadership based political culture, a very strong also administrative centralized culture, as we can see. 
even if you can notice some exceptions, like for the National Ad Addresses Database, which is a very interesting example of a French collaborative project between civil society and, and administration, we can see that the French administration is pretty shy for common goods. We can also see that French NGO were very skeptical about the French OGP action plan, especially ab on the part concerning the transparency of public action and the, the action of lobbies. All these overview give us a very nuanced view of the digital transformation of the, the French state. But what about the second part, the second dimension of a digital nation, the mobilization of the civil society? We have, since 2012, the rise of a French civic tech community. How is exactly organized the French civic tech? We have, like in many countries, like here, initiatives who want to change the rule of the democratic game and give citizens a new place due to digital culture. But I want to assume here that behind this unique expression of civic tech, we have, in reality, a large variety of political projects. How to find one's way through this frenzy of initiatives? To achieve this, I think it's necessary to shift from a tool-centered perspective, what tools can do, to prefer a political project perspective, what citizens can do with tools. In order to, I suggest a rough mapping of the French civic tech organized around the two main tensions in the community, the how and the why. So the first tension, the why, includes the desire to induce social transformation with, on the one hand, those who seek to deepen institutional democracy, and on the other hand, those who seek to transform the institutional uh, and renew the institutions. The second axis, the how, characterizes the degree of institutionalization and the proximity with the public authorities. On one side, we find projects that fall within a rationale of counter power or counter democracy, like said Heather this morning. That's, that is to say, they want to affect institutions from outside. At the other end of the axis, we find projects that collaborate actively with the public authorities. This work reveals several trends that allow to identify four groups of civic tech. The first group is the external critics. It regroups initiatives focusing on counter power and deepening democracy by monitoring institutions. The work done by the NGO, the French NGO, Regard Citoyen, Citizen Overlook, and its tools, nosdeputés.fr, ourrepresentative.fr, is a good example. Using an open source platform, it assembles all the data concerning uh, representative activities, attendance, or uh, participation in commissions, things like that. And they use it to make graphs and visualization to allow citizens to follow and evaluate their actions. The second group, the external reformers, seek to deepen the functioning of representation by encouraging collaboration between citizens and institutions. In this category, we can find tools for collective intelligence and debating platforms like Politizer, Stig, or uh, Cap Collective, or this one called Vox.org, who is a, a tool for comparing electoral programs. For the time being in France, the external reformers are the best developed category of civic tech, the most visible, perhaps also the less critical. The less critics about French government, but we can discuss it, and those who used to empower the empowered. The third group, the critical reformers, would belong to the field of counter power and they seek to transform institutional democracy by disruption, like say, again, Essan this morning. Here, the idea is to mobilize civil society in order to renew institutions, 
in a civic hacking perspective. Like you know very well here, activists and developers meet at Hackathon to improve those civic techs. In France, the Fork Network uh, has been organizing since almost two years hackathons to contribute to the dynamics and to develop an active open source community in France. The last group, the Embedded Hackers, regroups actors seeking to hack democracy from inside. Here we find, for example, platforms that want to associate citizens to lawmaking. This is the case of the platform called Parlement et Citoyens, Citizen and Parliament, which proposes an online debating tool to bring about citizen amendments in legislative drafts. Examining the French civic tech this way makes possible to highlight at least two major results. The first one, that there is a tension between two visions of civic tech. Each one performs a different conception of democracy. On the one hand, we have the civic startups, which try to conciliate business and general interest by collaboration with institutions. On the other hand, Civic hacking try to prove that collective interest is now associated to common good and to communities that use them. Civic startups improve democracy by delivering a service, when civic hacking try to empower a network based on shared values. The second result is that there is a risk that French civic tech will be absorbed by GovTech initiatives as a kind of sponsorized citizen expression. We observe that the role of public actors in the civic tech ecosystem is not very really clear. Most of its action is to open democratic markets, which largely reinforce and empower the civic startups model. Meanwhile, civic hacking remains fragile in France because communities' works need time on juridical innovation to develop new kind of public and private coalitions. To conclude, we can see that the main challenge for having a digital nation in France or everywhere else, 1.0 or 2.0, is a problem of political determination. Open is often seen as a concession, as a detour to ultimately preserve power relationship. For the civic tech, we can see that there is the risk is to focus on technological solutions and economic benefits without a real a strong political perspective. If they think only about services, public authorities miss will miss an opportunity to find solutions for the three crucial issues for the digital future of our societies, fighting against inequality, the promotion of a full citizenship, and the defense of, a, of democracy as the expression of people's will. Thank you. Che -che. Please welcome our uh, next speaker, Perry Chain. I'm sorry that I will speak in Mandarin because it's more easier for me to deliver my message. Hello, <coughs> 呃，今天我是代表这个台湾数位科技与政策协进会啊，啊，这个协进会来跟大家做这个说明哈。那这个协进会
成立是在去年成立，那它成立的目的就是，当我们政府看我们看到政府在推动所谓的数位国家的时候，我们常常发现很多政策，还有所谓的法令，其实都没跟上，所以就由一些朋友们来筹组了这么一个活动，哈，这个这个协进会。那今天协进会的秘书长也在那个地方，哈。啊，那个 T W Nick 的董事长哈，这一张投影片刚刚那个打的，这是我同事帮我抓下来的哈，就是 Canada 那个朋友 Derek 他们也提到的，就是说，基本上在网络时代，政府不应该是一个孤岛啊。那我想各位心里头可能都知道，我们政府常常在反映一些事情的时候，好像。不是一个完整的政府，而是会有很多地方会有断点啊。那当然，刚刚我们也听到这个其他的国家来讲，他这个在其他很多政府也会发生，但是我们总是希望说这些事情可以避免嘛。那数位化其实是可以让这些资讯可以比较流通，比较容易避免哈。那这是世界经济论坛。他提到的数位转型，他启动第四次的数位革命啊。那如果我们要用所谓的 digital transformation 这个字眼的话，在我脑袋中闪过的就是说，既然是 transformation， 那应该是很多事情是跟过去不一样。就跟我们在讲 transformer， transformer 变形金刚变完之后，其实它的形体是完全不一样的啊。那就拿台湾来讲。台湾，我们过去各位所看到的一些数位的一些资讯系统，我们也看到一些很不错的资讯系统哦。举个例子来讲，各位都报过税啊，报税以前我们年轻的时候报税是自己要收集各种东西，现在可能对我们来讲是很方便的，你就是当肉下来，那你确认一下，送上去就结束了。这是整个做法上就不一样。那我们会期待是不是有更多这样子的东西，它可以来产生。举个例子来讲，我常常在觉得，比如说是我们当数位化走到现在这个样子的时候，前一阵子我们在谈我们国家的这个呃组织改造，政府的组织改造。那当我们很多事情因为有了数位化之后，数位化的组织是不是应该要变大一些？否则数位化的工作就做不完嘛，对不对？那有一些工作被数位化，能够增加它的效率。那那一些组织是不是可以调整、转型一下，或者是组织稍微变小一下？这个都是，也许在 digital transformation 的时候，我们在整个结构上是不是可以来做一些思考？那我们看到其他的国家，他们怎么在谈 digital transformation？ 当然，他们在谈这件事情的时候，还没有这个数这个名称 digital transformation 出现。但是，美国在二零零二的时候，它已经有一个 e government act 啊，那它会有一个所谓的一化资讯化办公室啊。那到了二零一五年的时候，它有一个。Fitera 的一个 act 它出现啊，但它的目的就是说，当数位化进步到目前这个样子的时候，资讯可以改变这么多事情，应该 empower 政府单位的资讯人员，他们在采购上可以具备更多的弹性，更多的 authority authority 来做。举个例子来讲，这里面都讲说，比如说对 open source 的采用不能有。所谓的歧视或差别待遇啊，那我们来看一看，我们政府在 open source， 我们讲很多，但是事实上，当我们在真的在推动的时候，在政府单位，它的成效如何？这个也是我们可以来探讨的哈、啊。那至于德国，它就设了所谓的呃联邦运输及数位基建部嘛哈、啊。那日本它就有一个啊 CIO 哈、啊，它这个是在好像在二零。哪一年成立的哈？那韩国他们就是 c 
科技技术跟资讯通讯部，中国它设的工业和讯息部，澳洲它设的数位转型组，新加坡，它啊、呃、成立了一个 Government Technology Agency， 它整并的底下的这些单位，同时在二零一八的零五年的时候，它成立那个 Smart Nation 的 Digital Government Office， 它为了。这个所谓的 Smart Nation， 它特特别成立的一个单位哈。台湾过去做过很多事情，啊，做打下了一些好的基础哈。比如说在四十年前，政府它成立部会的资讯部，那是我们年轻毕业的时候，啊，我们就看到很多政府单位有资讯部。那现在我们来看，现在很多当我们在谈 Open Data， 它常常就是跨部门的嘛，啊，那当跨部门它在整整合运用的时候，当我们在谈 AI 的时候。它又是跨领域的，那我们就不希望，就是说，在政府单位，它还是部会是 silo 啊，就是一块一块的。那当然，在民间也同样必须去处理这些问题啊。那这个台湾当年在三十年前，其实我们在 PC 跟 IC 的投入，到现在我们做得很好嘛。但是两千年之后，我们在 Internet 上面、新经济的上面，我们又。有什么样的成果？这个我觉得也是值得我们探讨。那我们在想的问题就是说，我们必须从结构上来思考这些问题。那这个变化大家我想也知道哈。一九六七年最大的公司叫 IBM， 二零一七年年底，这是二零一七年底的报告哈。这前面这些都是数位化的公司啊。那这个是从 Fidelity， 各位如果用 Google 去查。打这两个字 ，fidelity 跟 industry， 它就出来这个画面。这个画面很惊悚哈、哦。这个画面你看一下，我们台湾一天到晚在谈的就是住房的问题。住房的问题在美国，其实它的 market cap 它是一点一八个，一点一八兆哈、哦。我们来看 IT，IT IT 是七点七一兆。那我们台湾之光半导体。半导体，这是台湾之光 semiconductor 的 semiconductor equipment， 啊 ，one point five one trillion US dollar， 啊，一点五亿兆。但是这个 B 跟 IT service 就是软体的服务，它是一点七三兆。这里面还有一个 software， 它二点三六兆。这一块跟这一块都比半导体都大很多。那台湾最大当然就是电信公司嘛，大家看到在 IT 这领域相关的 ICT。那 communication communication 这里面四点七八，那里面有一个 interactive media 的 service， 这个其实就是 Google 他们这些的 Google 啦 Facebook 这些公司哈。那原本他是把它放在 IT 里 information technology， 现在把它拿出来放在 communication 这里面来，所以 communication 这一块看的是比较大。那如果把这一块再拿到归到这里面，那 communication 真的就比 IT 就少很多了。产业我们要谈的诉求就是产业变化这么大的时候啊，竞争这么惨烈啊，各个国家有些国家都用国家的力量在谈这些国家的竞争嘛哈，已经不是产业跟公司的竞争了哈。那我们认为台湾其实是有需要高于目前部会层级，也就是在行政院层级的 CIO 组织。那他要干什么呢？他就可以跨部会，甚至从政府单位跨到产业。做整合性的思考，那这样子对于国家的建设的规划、资源的分配、法治的跟上，前一阵子这个呃 Uber 哈，或者是第三方支付，或者是数位货币这一些哈，那我们就会看到，我们第一个要先探讨说，这是谁该去处理的问题，好，那就是我们没有一个。够高层级的 c r o 的组织可以来帮忙提供 consultation 嘛？哈，啊，那另外就是触动产业的发展哈。那这件事情啊，不是只有这个协会在谈，其实业界的人已经谈了很久了哈。那各位到网络上都可以找得到哈。那 Gartner 哈，他也提到哈，当政府在转型的时候哈 c r o 他扮演了重要的角色，我就不一一来练哈。那。我们国家的是哪一个？我们强调的是专责，还有专职，啊，专责跟专职，那它是一个正式的组织，有编制，有预算，它有 authority， 可以去协调各个部会，啊
。那这个是啊、呃，我们的段宜康段委员他曾经在立法院咨询，他说他看到的是有三个啊，在我们国家的 CIO 的部会里面有三个组织。是比较像他是业务单位，而不是幕僚单位。那他谈的就是说，如果你是在幕僚单位，通常在人员的编制上，常常就会受到很大的局限。好、哦，那如果按照政府单位 CIO 的一些朋友的讲法，他会是这样，就是说，当你是幕僚单位的时候，你觉得有一些业务，他必须要透过数位化去做 enabling 的时候，因为你是幕僚单位。如果业务单位他不 support， 他不认为这件事情该做，你幕僚单位一点办法都没有啊！所以常常就是资讯单位的人，他们很积极，可是事实上有很多事情，人家说那是我的业务，你不要来管太多，就会受到一些障碍在那个地方啊。那当然有人会说，那只要这个部会的首长是英明啊，他很清楚，那事情就推得动。那我们的讲法是说，我们不能。老是靠一个英明的首长，我们要把英明这个事情落在制度上，有一个制度在那里，那有一个正式的编制的组织，所以只要数位化的事情，我们就有一个就责，然后可以承担责任的单位在那个地方啊。那以境外电商这个，我想大家也常常谈很多，牵扯到很多税的问题啊。那现在当然就是啊，财政部啦，他们在财谈这些事情嘛。可是他们对于数位化是不是？有这么深入的了解，这可能又是另外一个探讨的议题啊，啊，那总之，虚拟跟实体已经混在一起了，这个是一个对现在是一个很大的冲击跟挑战嘛，啊，那十个引爆点在列在这个地方，那这所有的东西都是跟资讯，跟需要一个够高单位的层级的人，他来统筹管这个事情，来处理这些事情啊。美国联邦政府。他的 IT 的支出，我们可以看到，他原本预期是这样成长，可是事后最后是这样子的成长。当然，在二零零八零九的时候，他有个金融海啸，那在这个之后，其实 Cloud 这个议题也起来了，所以他们就借着 Cloud 的所谓的 Share Resource 的方式来降低它 Infrastructure 的 Cost。当然，他们也重新去思考他们的国家的资讯建设到底应该怎么做，所以 Cost 并没有原本。投入的那么多啊，但是它还是持续在增长，它占了整个国家的比例是二点六二啊。那这个是我从 Gartner Gartner， 我想大家也知道，它里面所找到的，在美的里面的资料，就美国的非呃 Federal 这一边啊，他们每一个人，每一个公务人员，他们一年他的 expanding 哈是呃一万七啊。那它的资讯能源占整个组织比是六点九，那在 local government 啊 state 这边，它是二呃三点二个 percent 啊，在啊、呃、州呃这就是 states 里面哈、啊，它是三点二，那在 federal 这边是六点六点九啊，那我们国家的比例其实据其实我是我们透过很多管道其实找不到特定的一些资料，但是据。各种资资讯的来源，我们绝对是小于一个 percent， 绝对是小于一个 percent 啊。那如果按照可以找得到的政府的资讯预算，我们占整个中央政府资讯，台湾的资讯预算大概占整个中央政府的预算的零点七一啊，哦，就是整个中央政府的预算里面属于资讯的大概占零点七一，所以这个就会让我们受到一些发展上的限制啊。那。数位科技它是具备一些破坏性，所以我们要有新的思维来做一些改变。啊，这个我想都不用讲了，就是很多产业就是因为数位化所以被摧毁掉。所以我们在想的就是说，因为数位化之后，我们有哪些事情可以不用做？我们的组织上可以做什么调整？可是，在调整这些之前，哈，那我们有没有比较高层级的单位，他可以来统筹规划，来谈这些事情？那我们要问的一个问题。我们国家现在的资讯长是谁？啊，那我知道，我可以从官方上面会得到很多种不同的答案啊。在法定上，应该是我们行政院副院长啊，他应该是这个哈。那那这个，可是我们行政院副院长其实他是很多事情在忙，我想大家都知道。那呃，我们到底有什么样的方式来让我们有一个
真正的资讯长的办公室，他也是正式编制的组织，跟他有职权。然后可以来做真正的 coordination， 然后 daily operation， 它就这样一直下去，这是我们在想的问题。好，所以结论就是，在我们在谈 digital nation 这件事情的时候，我们先想一想，我们在我们整个政府的结构上面，能不能拉出一个国家资讯或数位化的专责的单位，它才能够担责跟被就责。我们想到任何数位化的事情，可以先从它那边进去，然后它去 coordinate 所有政府单位。看看到底来怎么处理这个问题哈，还有一个就是采购法，也是业界很多人努力了非常久哈。那其他的国家一直是在改变这个采购法来促进产业的发展。那在台湾这个采购法几乎呃不太跟得上这个所谓的数位化或者是所谓的资讯的这个所谓的知识经济的这个这个方案哈。那我们国家结论就是我们国家需要一个操可操作的。这个数位转型的总战略，那我们是建议应该大家来思考一下，拉出一个行政院层级的 CIO 的组织。好，谢谢Okay, let's start our QA session now. Hello, Derek. You're back.、Uh, I believe Perry just posed a question for Audrey, so I hope she will answer it late,、uh, a bit later. And I want to ask、uh, my own question, and then we'll start taking questions from、uh, Slido and the floor. So my question is:、um, It's good. It's fantastic to have、uh, the four, the four of you here to talk about your vision of a digital nation. And but I want to ask、uh, something about、uh, along the line with Perry about the older system, specifically the procurement system in the government. So、uh, as Audrey has mentioned, Taiwan is going to have several sandboxes programs, and for France you have entrepreneur programs, which is much very a very new advancement. And I I'm wondering how are you going to bridge the results of these programs into the existing government because. Uh, what kind of、uh, reformation in the existing procurement system is required? Do you think uh, are, uh, so that we can、uh, channel these innovations into existing government?、Uh, especially given that,、uh, as far as know,、uh, in Taiwan and Canada, procurement information are not even open data yet. So, what's your view about this?、Uh, do I take it? Derek, you want to speak first? Okay, so let's follow this sequence. Derek, please. Wow! Start off with a, with an easy question. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's like trivial. You've heard it hundreds of times. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the short answer is that I mean procurement is one of the big sticky things when we talk about.、Um, Creating a digital nation, government becoming more digital. One of the key pain points, key sticky points on this is going to be completely transforming how procurement happens,、um, and that's hard. That takes time because procurement is tied to policy and rules and regulations, and those take a while to change.、Um, one of the things we're we're trying to figure out is how can governments do more、uh, micro procuring, so there's small scale procurements that allow us to more nimbly support.、Um, Civic tech spaces, for example.、Um, this is one of the things that, with the municipal innovation pilot project I'm working on, we're hoping will help、uh, is is explore different vehicles in which governments can、uh, move smaller amounts of resources、uh, into spaces like the civic tech space.、Um, there's going to be a lot of experimentation.、Uh, I know when I was in the UK, they're also experimenting with new、uh, ways of doing procurement that allows for. This lightweight, quick,、um, sort of shifting of resources.、Um, yeah, it, it, but it's definitely a tricky one. <laughs> it's 
it's definitely a tricky one, particularly because governments are, are entrenched into certain ways of, of moving resources. One of the big challenges we have in government of Canada is historically we have invested a lot into digital tech through a lot of major companies. Um, so the big companies, and that's how we're designed. We've already got preset processes and relationships and stuff like that that sort of direct us towards these these larger sort of more traditional uh, tech companies um, and now we're trying to rewrite the processes to allow us to have more nimbleness but it definitely takes time so it's, it's going to take some time and and some some uh, failure we're going to make mistakes as we try to figure this out and so it'll be interesting to see the repercussions of when you make mistakes with money how that plays itself out will be interesting Yeah, literally the the first policy that I uh, started to work with two years ago is the Shell Ministry's procurement policy, um, and that was because I advocated for very much the same thing before I become <laughs> the digital minister, and <laughs> I really want to get a procurement uh, laws fixed. Um, so w we've made some some improvements. For example. Um, at the moment, um, if you start a government procurement, you up to one million um, Taiwan dollars, uh, you can actually just go to the most um, valuable or the most fitting uh, process. And, and it was like just a, a 10% of that, right? It was um, around 100K. Uh, so that has been raised. I cannot take credit for that. Uh, it is a PCC and Commission of Chance work, but it really enables us to basically have a tenfold increase on uh, procurement on medium and small and enterprises. That's the first one. And the second thing is that uh, we made the Linux Foundation Open API standard a national standard so that uh, if you start a procurement uh, and the vendor provides something that is only human readable but not machine readable, you can demand that uh, vendor to uh, develop a machine to machine interface for it. And if they say, I'm going to charge you a lot more for that, uh, you can say that you're not professional according to our procurement laws, so I'm going to another vendor. Uh, and so this is another change uh, that we have already put in, and it's actually already in effect. Um, the, at the moment, the new procurement law is in the uh, parliament. We expect it to be passed mm, later this year, which will further uh, enable the um, best value bid, as we call it, and also opens the doors for best value bid uh, to mean social value and other kind of value in addition to economic or professional value. So that is, again, uh, pretty good news. And finally, the procurement data, um, the public um, procurement agency has ruled that it could be made available as a freedom of information, but uh, because when in here in open data, we say that it has to be compatible with the Creative Commons attribution license, which means that you can use it for a lot of commercial purpose. You can even change the numbers and, and things like that. There's basically no restriction of you modifying uh, the data by yourself, and there's a lot of reservation actually uh, for that. So personally, I work on a dictionary called the Domoe Dictionary. And when we talk with the Ministry of Education of releasing dictionary data, th they have one reservation about the open data license. They don't want people to change the number of strokes of a character or to translate the dictionary into a simplified character that confuses everybody. And so finally, they chose a license that is restricted according to international open definition that basically say you can only do limited modification of it. You can still visualize it, but you cannot change it a lot. And then you can only use it for purposes that are of common good of um, domestic people. So under these new terms in our next open uh, data council, we're going to announce that uh, the procurement data is going to be available under these revised terms, which we will not call open data because it is not Creative Commons attribution, but it is. it will be public available and able to be analyzed, although you cannot freely, you know, modify it in there's some restrictions. Yeah. Do you want to answer the question about uh, Chief Information Office, sir, or later? I, I mean, we, w the, it used to be that the Deputy Premier, Simon Zhang, was the CIO, but that was the previous administration. 
At the moment, our CIO is uh, Minister Wu Zhenzhong, who is also the Science and Technology Minister with a portfolio and the head of the Board of Science and Technology, s which has real procurement power and authoritative power, which is why, at the moment, the FinTech Sandbox, or indeed Sandbox ORG or whatever, really works pretty well because cryptocurrency, for example, the financial minister just said, okay, we're going to uh, be in charge of the financial um, you know, anti-money laundering part of the cryptocurrency. So at the moment, the head of BOSD, uh, Minister Wu Zhenzhong, I think is doing a fantastic job, uh, which you just described. But I do agree with you that you can, we cannot always rely on the fact <laughs> that the head of BOST, the head of NDC, uh, happens to be very uh, forward-thinking, uh, and, and there needs to be some way to guarantee um, the uh, responsible agency. I think we've made some uh, advance by having a GDPR negotiation office within the NDC, uh, which will talk about these kind of cross-regional uh, issues, but we don't have a law to support this kind of thing. And again, at the end of this year, we're going to pass, hopefully, the Digital Communication Act, which again is a V Taiwan um, you know, uh, output. But the, the Digital Communication Act will, for the first time, task the Executive Yuan to build in a level that is above all the different ministries a task force that has sufficient budget, that work with the civil society, any civil society organization that can work within the spirit of uh, internet governance will be considered into the governance system. And so I think it really took a lot of time. I personally worked on the previous version of the Digital Communication Act when it was still called the Electronic Communication Act. Uh, that was in 2015 or 16. But I think at the end of this year, because of CPTPP, this is finally going to be passed. And after that, we'll have the sufficient unit and budget for it. You have something to add? Okay. Uh, 就跟我剛剛講的就是我們政委有提到就是說現在無政宗嘛是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是是
叫做资讯总数，但是我们现在谈的资讯总数不是一条边的，我们是非一条边式的，或者是什么样的结构都可以。但是我们希望就是有这么一个组织，它可以出来。那这样子，当有关于数位化的问题，我们就知道说可以去找这个单位。好，好，跟大家分享，谢谢。啊，谢谢。我们现在可以，呃、uh, ，we can take a few questions now. You can use the microphone in front of you. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please first tell us who you are, and please keep it brief and make sure it is a question. Uh, my name is Paul Jubin. I'm a sociologist. In, I'm employed here in this building uh, upstairs. And uh, uh, thank you very much for all the presentation. Very interesting. Um, we are, with my colleagues, we are preparing a survey on risk and technology. Uh, risk and new technologies and uh, I was just wondering I think all of you share uh, the same values of uh, I think your keywords are like openness to be open to be transparent to be participative and I think Clement's presentation mentioned how to protect democracy so I just wonder uh, I know it's not the topic of the panel eh? you're more concerned about how to share data and these sort of things. But just concern, because recently in Taiwan we had this uh, problem of fake news, which led uh, a diplomat based in Japan to commit suicide. I found that terrible. And, uh, well, I don't know the reason, but it seems that uh, the fake news was created by China. And false or true, I mean, we, we all know that uh, uh, the risk of being hacked by China is, 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 a, is a reality. And, um, well, I guess um, Taiwanese government is doing a lot to protect uh, government uh, digital information. But I'm just concerned, uh, uh, do you have any uh, research group working on how to protect the average citizens of being act, or how to protect uh, Taiwanese? But maybe the same question could be asked for France and, and Canada. I mean, uh, those countries are not... Uh, could be also act by Chinese hackers, actually. So, yeah, I just wonder, it's, uh, it's good to be open, but uh, how to protect yourself from people who don't share your democratic values? Simon, do you want to, uh, sorry, Derek, do, do you want to answer first? That's, yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, I mean, the short answer is, I mean, yeah, there's, there's definitely people working in the government of Canada on, on this question around um, protecting, yeah, protecting citizens, protecting government from um, digital espionage, like governments meddling, and organizations meddling in sort of the digital space. Uh, I mean, a big one in Canada that sort of has shaken things up is, is what's happened in, in the U.S. with the last Amer uh, U.S. election. And that sort of put everybody on notice that, you know, this is a thing. <laughs> this can happen anywhere. Um, so there's definitely teams within the government of Canada who are working on, you know, ensure we have an election coming up next year. Um, so that's one area of focus. But I think your question is actually beyond that, uh, looking at how, what's government doing to protect citizens uh, against um, this type of stuff. I don't know. That's a really good question. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I don't know, I, and I'm not sure what can be done. Um, I think we're still figuring this stuff out. Uh, this is sort of a new space. Uh, we're still learning the rules. We're still learning the role government needs to play in this space. Um, so I, I don't think I have actually a very good answer for you at this point, but it's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Uh, Audrey, please. Yeah, um, so... Um, first, I, I would like to encourage you to um, Google this <laughs> keyword, moderate approach to moderating. Uh, I will post it on Slido. Uh, and it will point to a World Economic Forum uh, report. I'm no longer working uh, with the WEF on the Future Council uh, at the moment, uh, but I, I used to work with these people, and I think that provides a great overview that I cannot explain everything uh, in the two minutes or so. But I will point out two things. First, I think it's not helpful to use the F word. I never use the F word. Uh, 
um, the, the word you just used to describe news. Uh, because both my parents are journalists, and I think that's a affront to journalism if you use the, fake, uh, the F word. Um, I, I distinguish between two kind of information. If a journalist produced content that later pro uh, proves to be not entirely true, they had not done their fact check very well, then it's misinformation. They're still doing their journalistic duties. It's just, it so happens that a report is something that is counterfactual, but they're not intentional. This is misinformation. On the other hand, there are people who pose as journalists who write something that looks like a journalistic output, but they are not professional journalists and they may have a counter-democratic intent. And we call it disinformation because it is intentional. And the F word describes both things. And I think it's very unhelpful to discussion. And this is the first point I would like to make. And the second is that for misinformation, I think in Taiwan, what we do is that in the government, we don't lie when we can help it. And whenever <laughs> there is a uh, misinformation from the media, now every ministry has a scoreboard of how short the time span between the initial misinformation and the clarification to add to the factual issue. And so there is on the um, Executive Yuan's website, there is a whole section dedicated to timely response to journalistic misinformation. And I think the average score now is four hours. And we're just, you know, keep upping the, the thing, um, the shortening the time span due to the peer pressure. And so basically, if people would like to wait for three or four hours, you can almost always reliably get a clarification from a ministry if there is a journalistic mistake. And that's for misinformation. And for disinformation, that calls to a completely different solution. And I think uh, it the most helpful metaphor is how we solve spam email before. Back in 2000, spam was a real thing. People call it the spam wars, right? I participated in spam assassin. People thought technology can fix it, so regulation can fix it. People thought, you know, it takes a strong consumer protection. People think we should all switch to Gmail or, or whatever to, to solve uh, spam. But on the other hand, Finally, when spam was solved, it is not by any single actor. It's by a lot of small civil society and public sector activities that gradually increase the cost of spam until where it's not profitable anymore to send spam. And so I think we should take this approach on disinformation. And there's a lot of civil tech projects in Taiwan, such as the COFAX group and so on, actively contributing to this area. I think. We have to, to think that open is not like open every door or every window. Sorry. Uh, I think we, when we mean open government or open information or something like that, it's not like opening every window or every door of, of a country. It's to organize the circulation. That means you can have some protections. I think there is two main issues. There is the question of security, like you, you said, and the question of manipulation. For the, the manipulation, you, you can develop uh, uh, at least one uh, a legislative approach to, uh, to, to, to organize uh, a, a, a content policy uh, and to organize uh, some uh, fact-checking uh, some fact-checking application like we saw during the, the summit. And you have the the, the, the security issue about how to protect yourself, how to protect your infrastructures. Um, there is many, uh, many ways to, to do that, like, yeah, like you said, but I think it's important to keep in mind that we should not uh, put uh, all our action to, to, to in the same way. That's why I'm, I'm never talking about digital transformation of the state, never. I'm talking about digital transition or adaptation. Because I think we have to be clever on our move. We have to, to keep in mind that some of our societal aspects, some of our political aspects have to, to keep in real hand. And we have to, to, to keep the hand on, on them. Uh, for I take just one example. I'm not sure that uh, online vote can uh, uh, totally replace uh, the, the traditional vote because we have seen in different elections, in different experimentation, that uh, 
uh, it can be uh, very dangerous and manipulated. Uh, I'm taking one question from Slido and then one more question from the floor. Okay. The question on Slido states, uh, how does privacy and information security fit in the digital nation? How do you propose to address the privacy of the citizens? Uh, Dirk, please. I love how I keep going first, too. I, I, I don't get much of a chance to walk up here. Okay. Um, so I, I think a couple things. I think part of it is uh, giving people more control over their data will be a key thing uh, to ensure their privacy. So that each person has, is able to choose how and when they share their data and what that looks like. Um, I think the other part of it is um, being clear what spaces are public spaces and what spaces are private spaces and what spaces are sort of pseudo public private and and how that works within those spaces will help as well giving people the information to allow them to protect their privacy when they want to or to engage in spaces be much more open when they want to I think an interesting question I'm curious to sort of in response to that question uh, is how our understanding of privacy is going to shift and change in the coming years. I mean, each of these words are, and how we understand them within a cultural context is fluid. It changes with time. And so I think privacy is going to be a term that's really going to be reimagined over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And I don't know where that's going, but I am really curious because I think it is going to shift a lot. So, um, so my question, uh, I think that the idea for privacy and security should not be confused. So I'm going to answer the two separately. For cybersecurity, and this is also actually a answer to the lack of IT budget, we will very soon uh, increase massively the IT budget because um, starting next year, I think, uh, for all the government major projects, there must be 5% regardless of whether it's information projects or not, to be dedicated to cybersecurity. And if it's smaller projects, it's 6%. If it's an even smaller project, it's 7 or something like that, right? So, so, um, so at the moment, it's under 1%, but it will jump <laughs> by a very large degree uh, just by the, the virtue of having all the government uh, procurements be including cybersecurity as a very strong element, at least 5% of the total uh, project. And I think this is because we really want a good relationship with, the, for example, the HitCon and the other white hat hacker um, industry and civil society in Taiwan. We want those white hat people to work with our system, like when I set up the Sandstorm system in PEDIS, I work with DEFCOR and the other people to do penetration testing and so on. So we make sure that they feel they have contribution to the society, they are paid very well, they get meetings with presidents every once in a while, uh, and, and so they don't go to the dark side. This is very, very important. <laughs> and and, and the, the, the dark side is always have more cookies. And so uh, and that, that is um, part of our procurement strategy. For data privacy, I think uh, I would just want, want to say one thing. When we think of data or control of data or whatever, we're using a metaphor that treats data as an object, as an asset. And I think this is a very dangerous view. And this is my personal opinion, but also my opinion as digital minister as well. I think data should be seen as a beginning of a relationship. If you have data, in somebody else's control that begins a relationship where you can ask where have my data gone, how are you using for a purpose, and so on, which we translate to Wenzi here. And the people controlling the data, they have responsibility to keep it updated, to keep you informed, to get the propagated consent, and so on, which we translate as Dangzi here. And we need to build an accountability mechanism between it that makes these kind of uh, bridges possible. The GDPR is a good start, but it doesn't go far enough. We really need to go even farther than the GDPR for the mechanism in between that we can protect people's privacy by design. And this is what we call But interestingly, all those three different words, Wenzi, Dangzi, and Kezi, transpire back to accountability. Right? So uh, it, it shows that accountability is a dynamic relationship. And we think of data accountability, it should be seen as a relationship and not data as oil, as asset, or as objects. Uh, one more question from the floor, uh, please. 
Well, uh, thank you, Audrey, uh, Derek, uh, Clamont, and Perry and PM for this panel. It was very, very inspiring. Uh, I think that every presentation has explained on how existing nations like Taiwan, Canada, or France are addressing new models, new models, new methodologies, thanks to digital technologies. But the title of the panel was Imagining Digital Nations. So I'm wondering if any of you uh, have any idea of how to go one step beyond, and I mean, not only managing uh, the digital capabilities of the existing nations, but to imagine new nations that might not exist in our political maps, but in the era of online communities and platform-based economies might emerge from the geography of the internet. Like nations that don't exist right now in the map, but they, they can be imagined with this new paradigm. Another easy question for you, Derek. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Actually, could someone repeat the question? I, I can only get bits, bits and pieces of it. Short, short version of the question. Okay, I, mean, I was asking if you can imagine uh, a digital nation that might not exist at this moment, but that can emerge from the internet, out of the geographical uh, frontiers that exist uh, right now. New kind of mentions because of the internet. And uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, could we imagine a, a digital nation? I mean, I, th I think so. I, I, um, I'm trying to think of the author. Um, I've been reading a bunch of authors who've been talking about this concept about how the internet is causing us to um, almost become like a interconnected um, organism. It, there's, there's, there's like a, a collective identity that's developing as we become more and more interconnected. Uh, the internet's kind of forming this like societal, global, human brain um, that, that's really challenging our concept of <laughs> nation states and borders. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what that exactly means. And so uh, I think that is going to force us to really reimagine what nation states look like or if they exist in the future. I think these are actually all really interesting questions. Um, I mean, Estonia is doing some interesting stuff in terms of, you know, their, with their uh, e-citizen uh, system that anyone can become a citizen of, of Estonia and as businesses can as well. And that's really shifting the idea of borders as well. Um, so I, I'm not really answering your question, but uh, I'm, I'm acknowledging that I think you're, you're, you're sort of touching on something that we're going to be wrestling with more and more in the years to come. Uh, but I'm going to sort of pass this to the other panelists who I think will have better answers. Okay, Audrey, please. Okay, sure. Well, uh, like people know, I'm a conservative anarchist, right? Uh, An anarchist is someone who works to make sure that the power is horizontal and not vertical. And so I think internet still today, the internet society, the internet mechanism, is itself sovereign. It is the largest sovereign system that is not part of any multilateral system, right? It doesn't report to the UN ITU, although it runs a forum with it. It doesn't report to the US government, right? It spun off after Snowden. So, so it has its own legitimacy mechanism that is built entirely out of radical transparency and radical participation. So it's very easy to imagine a digital nation because that is the internet. The internet is a digital nation. Um, and whether it can keep its identity as sovereign is everybody's question because there are different world orders now. There are people who are balkanizing the internet by essentially turning it into intranets. There are people who are introducing um, in, uh, new innovations on internet that is basically surveillance uh, technologies that is not for anybody's benefit but theirs. So if internet loses its own legitimacy, then it doesn't have an army, it doesn't have a navy, it will lose its sovereignty. And so I think it's in all our best interest to participate in internet governance and make sure that the internet can keep its sovereignty and project its values back to the terrestrial beings. Just a few words because I'm a researcher, so I used to observe Monza and Imagine, but 
I guess in my presentation, I give you some elements with my uh, normative perspective because uh, I think a, a large part of my job is to 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 make oh sorry to make a, a theoretical ar arrangement to read to make a normative and philosophical perspective and to put it on trial with what I can observe in reality. And from the normative part, I can say there is two main uh, issues for the, uh, the digital state. There is the question of infrastructures with the openness, security, and everything. That's the administra administration part. Uh, like I said, a state uh, who is uh, able to adapt to new the new uh, issues uh, offered by, by, by digital. And the second one is about the mobilization of the, the of the society because if you are offering some openness tools, some open tools, you need to have a multitude to use them. If nobody is able to 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 to, to take the opportunity you are g you are given to the citizen, uh, you will not have your 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 digital nation. So you have both to to manage to include people and to give them infrastructures. Yep. I think that's it for this session. Thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, the next session has already started at conference room R0, so if you want to go there, please proceed. And thanks everyone again.